phones out or your Bibles out or whatever you read the Bible on. I've got a couple scriptures I want to go through. And it's so good to be back worshiping with family. Um, <clears throat> why don't we have a couple people? Um, I'm gonna. I think I'll just have a couple people read just to get some involvement here. Um, the first scripture we're gonna go to is John 14. So, tonight we're talking about uh, God's will in your life. So, how many of you want to walk in the purpose that God created you for? Mm -hmm. Okay. And in, in line with that, how many of us want to, want to do God's will? Whether we know what God's will is or not, whether we know fully to like it or not, we, we want to do His will. Okay. So, um, there are some things that we can see through Scripture clearly that reveal what the Father's will is. And there are a lot of things. It's not just one thing. Like, you know, Jesus was supposed to be the perfect representation of the Father. So, everything Jesus did, you can basically say, if Jesus did it, it was God's will. Because he only did what he saw the Father doing. He was there to represent the Father. He said, I do nothing of my own accord. Right? I only do what I see the Father doing. So everything Jesus did is God's will. So one thing that God spent, or that Jesus, he is God, spent a lot of time doing was healing. So we know healing is God's will. Uh, he talked, he preached the gospel of the kingdom. He didn't preach the gospel of Jesus because he was the gospel. But he preached the kingdom. And there's a lot of things we can unpack um, that we can say this is God's will. But one of the overarching themes and arguably the most important is this creation of a people that he wants relationship with. So we know that it's God's will for relationship. And we see it in so many ways. We see it in who God is himself, in the Trinity, the three persons that are one, they relate to each other. He is a relational God in the very essence of who he is. We, we can see that in the way he created, because if we look at things even in, in the subatomic particle level, we see relationship like the atomic bond, the, that which holds everything together, is the relationship between atoms. We see it in uh, the, the calling of a people as his church or his bride. The bride bridegroom relationship is the most intimate relationship that there is. Um, we see it in him making a covenant with a people because he wanted that relationship. Um, and even when Adam and Eve, when he created them to walk in his, the, it's the real word there was ruach, the breath of God. So, I mean, that's pretty intimate. You're, you're walking in the breath of God and even when they fell and made a mistake, his goal was to repair that relationship, right? Through sending Jesus. And so I could go on and on, but relationship is, is really important. So what we're going to talk about tonight is, um, is arguably the most important aspect. It's probably the most important message you'll ever hear. And I don't mean like tonight's version of it. Like... You know, I'm going to preach the best thing you've ever heard. But what I mean is the message 
in what I'm saying is the most important thing that you will hear. And we should probably preach it, well, we do actually preach it in some form every week. And it's about relationship. So let's go back to that question again. How many of us want to know God's will? How many of us want to, to know what our purpose is and walk it out? It's in us to want those things. Will someone read uh, John 14, 16? Just, you can just shout it out so everyone can hear. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Hold on a second, let me look at something. Scripture mixed up. Go figure. Um, read, uh, read John fifteen, um, one through eleven. We're going to do that one instead. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Okay. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Okay. So the key verse there is, is verse 5 that we're going to talk about is, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can't do anything. The, the stuff that we do in the flesh has pretty much no regard. Because we know that the fire will consume. I'm not going to go far on this direction, but the fire will burn up everything that we did and all the dead works, right? And uh, I can raise my hand and say, I've got a lot of dead works. Just stuff that I do that has no eternal purpose whatsoever. And um, did I before? Did I say John fourteen six? I thought you said sixteen. Yeah, maybe I'm just like out of it. But um, John fourteen six is what I meant to say. Whatever I did say, I don't know. But um, I'll read that real quick. Uh, Jesus answered, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me." So He's the vine. And he's the way, the truth, and the life. Okay. Um, I got a news flash for you. I know it's profound. But if you want to know God's will and you want to know your purpose, you will not find it anywhere except for in relationship with Jesus. And here's another news flash for you. He doesn't tell you ahead of time what it is. Now, I know that sounds like we all know that, 
But how many of us live, I can't say that I live every day so in Him that I'm not even concerned about what tomorrow brings or where I'm heading or what's coming up or any of that stuff. But when we learn to trust that relationship so much that we're more concerned about being with Him than we are anything that we do, we actually reach our purpose. But the problem is we don't know the difference between what we are doing in the flesh and what we are doing in the spirit or in the soul or in the spirit. What we're doing in the soul or the flesh versus what we're doing in the spirit. We so easily eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we don't actually know the difference often. And yet, you know, he told Abraham, go to the land that I will show you. He didn't tell him where to go. He didn't tell him how long it would take. He didn't tell him anything about, you no know, details. We don't know of any details. All we know is that he said, go and I'll show you. Just start going. How many of us feel comfortable with that? It, and it says he's the way, the truth, and the life. It doesn't say, and it also, let me just say this, it also says he's the, the vine, right? We, if we abide in him, we'll bear fruit. He doesn't say, I am Jesus. I will show you your plan for your life that you may fulfill it. I am Jesus. I'll tell you how long it will take until you fulfill your destiny. He doesn't say, I am Jesus. Rub my belly and I'll give you... No, I'm kidding. But notice, those are all the things that we ask or at least, again, okay, I'm just raising my own hand here. When I, I'm praying a lot of times, Lord, what am I supposed to be doing? Where am I supposed to be going? What job are you to have for me? All these questions about these details. And the whole time, he's just like smiling at me. Just like, me. It's painfully, painfully simple, but it's profoundly difficult because we're so caught up in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, doing the right things, instead of just being. But I've had little glimpses of what that looks like. How many of us want to, want to have a life where things happen that you and others around you say, there's no way you did that. That was something else. That was something beyond your capability, beyond your power. I mean, we all want to see that, right? And yet, if, we, if what we're reading is true, it's only found in Him. If we abide in Him, we'll bear fruit. We're trying to do all these things apart from the vine. We detach ourselves and go on these little missions and we do these things. We do all these... How many of you have seen Nacho Libre? We got to do all these churchy opportunities, right? And the whole time Jesus is like, that's great what you did, but you left me behind to do that. Now, we all know God is everywhere, so there's, you really can't run away from him. You can't be away from him. But there is a place where we abide with him. There's measures of his presence. There's um, that oneness that we can walk away from. And yet we do it so often, so frequently, so easily, we don't even know that we're doing it many, many times. So what would it look like to live a life so concerned about what he is doing and saying, so concerned about just being with him, that what we do doesn't doesn't make any difference. And, and trusting and, and knowing that when we're supposed to do something or when we're supposed to say something, because of that relationship, we'll just know. It just happens. I've, like I said, I've experienced little glimpses of what that looks like. And the funny thing is, well, it's not funny, really, it's sad. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll come from a, 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 that type of relationship 
something will happen in a good way. Like, I'll be in the grocery store and I'm just, you know, having that communion with God. And all of a sudden, my attention is drawn to someone and he gives me a word of knowledge for them or something like that. I go and the encounter is like a 10. And you're like, why doesn't that happen all the time? And I go right from that to leaving the vine to go do something for God, but not with Him. And I can't tell you exactly why that happens, because really it's kind of ridiculous. It's like, we should learn from that and say, oh, I don't ever want to do anything but that. But there's these, these divine encounters that only happen when we're abiding in Him, listening to His voice, being guided by Him, and then He says, oh, by the way, look at that person. I want you to do this. Now, He can still do that. We, have, we all have gifts. We all have the ability to hear God. And He will bypass our ignorance and our lack to touch people. He does it. He does it in my life all the time. Because sometimes he'll override my, whether I'm feeling or being spiritual in any way, and he'll touch someone. And it's fun. Um, but to live, live this supernatural lifestyle really requires us to, to have this oneness with him. You know, uh, elsewhere in scripture it says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. And then later in that section, it talks about why would you worry? The day has enough worry of its own. Um, but again, whether we have anxiety or worry about where we're supposed to go, what we're supposed to do, what kind of job we're supposed to have, or, or etc., you fill in the blank. Um, most of the time we probably have too much concern about those things. Because again, he's saying, don't worry about that. Don't even, who cares? When you need to know, I'll tell you. So just be with me. And here's, here's you know, this isn't in my notes, but this I think is important. We wonder many times why it seems like we are not changing, right? Like, we get in these cycles, like, yeah, I just wish I wouldn't do that anymore. I just keep doing it. Right? Or there's something we want breakthrough in our life, or there's, there's just some hindrance. I can guarantee you that every time that's because of us doing apart from the vine. Because when we spend, look, use, let's use the analogy of the vine, right? Fruit comes through the vine, right? And we're the branches. So fruit comes from us being connected. That means that what we're connected to, we get the fruit of. We become what, you, what we consume. If we're consuming the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which can be all these good churchy opportunities, right? We, we will reap from what we're connected to, what we're feeding from, what we're... Um, a part of. So how many of us want the change and the transformation where we can say, I was this and now I'm this and I was lost and now I'm found. I used to do these things but I'm a different person now. I just don't even have that desire anymore. That, I can guarantee you, is only found in spending time with Him because He will rub off on you. And so again, you know, we do a disservice a lot of times when we get people saved instead of introduce people to Jesus because there's a difference. Getting people saved means that it's all about doing these things. Even though we say, like, he died on a cross for you, but you should come to church every week. No one ever got to know Jesus by going to church in and of itself. Now, obviously, there's nothing wrong with going to church, but what's the point I'm making? The point I'm making is the doing of going to church. You could be a pastor with a seminary degree, with a doctorate, preaching and teaching for years, 
and you could not know him. And that would be a tragedy. Because scripture says, many will come in that day. It doesn't say a few, a handful of these, you know, nobodies. It says, many will come to me and say, didn't we do all these things in your name? And he'll say, I never knew you. You workers of lawlessness. That, those are harsh words. So we want to see transformation. We want to see change. We want things in our life to be better. We want our jobs to be more fulfilling. We want people, we want to be an impact to people. We want all these things, but we try to do them apart from the reality that it only comes when we are with Him and abiding in Him. That's what praying without ceasing means. We are communing with Him. It's not... Dear Jesus, amen. Thank you in Jesus' name, our Father in heaven. Right? That's not what praying without ceasing means. That's, that's religious. Praying without ceasing is constantly being aware, constantly asking, constantly abiding in the vine. And then we become the fruit of the vine. And we also see fruit of the vine. Now what happens when the vine dresser comes and starts trimming away? I think sometimes we think Jesus is, you know, I made a joke earlier, but there's kind of some, you know, some re reality to it that a lot of us think he's a genie. We just rub his belly and get what we want. But he's a loving father. And a loving father only does things for your good. And we need discipline because it's for our good. And that discipline looks like cutting the branch off. We're like, ouch. But he's like, but that's so you bear bigger, better, sweeter fruit. Because scripture says, he who is not disciplined is an illegitimate son. If you are going to be a son, you get disciplined. Because why? he shows no partiality. Right? If you're a son, he disciplines you. But we often run away from that. And I think maybe that's a hindrance sometimes. We, we've been taught this false gospel that he only wants us to be rich and have no problems. Sell everything you have and follow me. Oh, and by the way, blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. Oh, where's that in the American gospel? But I can tell you, I can promise you that when we abide in Him and we choose that overdoing, we choose to be connected to the vine as opposed to doing our own thing in our own way or even doing things for Him apart from Him. When we choose to abide, not only do we bear fruit, but we have the assurance that we are doing the will of God because the will of God is to have relationship with us. So if you want to know what God's will for your life is, it's for you to know Him. Period. All the other things, the fruit just comes. A branch, uh, uh, an apple tree doesn't say, Apples! Right? It just sits there and bears fruit. Right? Uh, I could use another fruit tree as an example, but I won't. But the same is true with us. When we just divide, we just bear fruit. It's, it should be easy. And, and how many of you know, especially those of you that have been a part of the movement since we started, you know that we have been praying for and talking about wanting to be a part of something that Clearly, we could not have done. We couldn't. People couldn't have said, "Well, those are like some really cool people, so that's why this stuff happened." And, well, they probably have a lot of money, and so that's why this happened. And, no, we want stuff to happen that people say clearly that was God, but we cannot have that happen until we let this reality sink in that it. There's nothing we can do to make that happen. There's only we can only be to make that happen. It's his pleasure that we bear much fruit. 
So we have to stop trying to produce fruit and let him bear it in us. Just let people pick our fruit. What would it look like if we walked so closely with him everywhere we go, everything that we do, that when we walk by people, we didn't say a word and they just go, what was that? Or they're like, you know, let's use the fruit analogy again. Oh, an apple. Well, I like that taste. Right? We didn't have to say, I'm an apple tree and my apples are pretty good. I bet you want them. Right? We don't have to be a salesperson. Anyone that's hungry, which the world is starving for God, and sees good fruit is going to pick it and eat it, right? But we're so concerned with doing all these things instead of being, abiding in the vine, bearing the fruit that people just pick and just eat and are like, what was that? Well, let me tell you. So, how much less stress I mean, he says, my burden is light, right? Our burdens aren't light because we're trying to do everything. And he's saying, just be. That's pretty easy. I'll just, like, bring people your way and stuff will happen. You won't have to do anything, I promise. I'll do it all. That's a pretty good, good deal. How many of us want to walk that out? I do. <clears throat> And I think the biggest hurdle is fear. But what about, but, but, I could give you a hundred butts right now. Like, not B-U-T-T butts, but. I could, I could give you a, a, a hundred examples in my own life, in my own mind, about my own situations and say, but what about, so, we have to trust him. And if we don't trust him, guess what? That's okay. It's not okay to stay there, but it's okay to be there. We just have to be honest about that and say, God, I don't trust you in this area. Oh, good. I'm glad you finally admitted it because I already knew that. Right? And so, again, even in not trusting him, if we do that, we're having a relationship with him by saying, I don't trust you. Thank you for telling me that. I already knew that. Why do you think you don't trust me? I don't know. I just don't. Well, let's talk about that. I don't want to. Okay. So, again, we have to be okay with where we're at but we have to be not okay with staying there. We have to engage him because that's where the change happens. That's where inner healing really happens. Like how many of you are, are familiar with inner healing ministry, prayer ministry? Okay. If you've ever done inner healing prayer ministry, you know that inner healing doesn't happen until God gets someone to that place where they can be open and listen to what Jesus has to say, because only there life comes and healing comes. They can't be like, you know, well, Scripture says this, so I'm just going to believe it. No. Again, there's nothing wrong with saying, well, this is true, but I'm going to choose to believe this and not this. That's not, I'm not saying that that's wrong. But what I'm saying is it doesn't take hold until Jesus through relationship, unravels what it is that's blocking that, and then he removes it. So you want to get healthy, you want to get free, you want to feel lighter, you want to hear God more clearly, more frequently, more often, you want to have divine encounters with people, you want to be an impact in your sphere of influence, you want all these things, abide in the vine. I know it's like the most painfully simple message you've ever heard, but it's probably, like I said, the most important. Because guess what? You do something you shouldn't have done, instant conviction. Oh, sorry. But you didn't leave him in, the, in that place, right? He just says, don't do that again. This is where I'm going. And we choose to follow him. Where we get into trouble is we do it anyway and we leave him. We run away. 
and do our own thing. So let the Holy Spirit, it's, I love the analogy, I, I believe it's, um, is it Bill Johnson that came up with the, the dove on your shoulder? If you had a dove on your shoulder and you wanted it to remain and not leave, but you needed to get from here to there, how would you walk? Probably not like that. You'd be like, right? Like every step you took would be, is it okay? Is it okay? And that's exactly what our walk with the Holy Spirit looks like. Is this okay? You know, we learn to walk with it on our shoulder. Now, obviously, it's not a bird on our shoulder, necessarily. Though he could manifest himself that way if he wanted to. But that's what the picture of it looks like. And I don't know about you, but I want to be there. So let's, um, let's just pray and ask God to divinely do something in us to help us get to this place. Even if it's just a step this week, one step closer to that. 